joining us tonight. I'm Dan Bauck. I'm the University Professor for Core 152. That means I'm the, the chair for Core 152, for the challenges of modernity. And I expect all of you are here because you are uh, thinking about the challenges of modernity quite a lot this semester. So it's my pleasure to welcome you here for this lecture and performance featuring Colgate's own Professor Ryan Chase, who I introduced in a moment, with the Manhattan String Quartet, uh, who you see before you now, who many of you have gotten to see uh, up close and personal already, and, will, and some of you will still tomorrow see them in the workshop and get to work with them. So uh, here they are, let me introduce them. Uh, Curtis Macumber, uh, I didn't do right, Macumber. That's good. On violin, no, no. Kelvin Wiersma on violin, John Dexter on viola, and Chris Finkel playing the cello. This lecture performance would not be possible without the hard work and support of Lorraine Joseph in the music department, Kelly Snyder in university studies, and the director of university studies, Nancy Reese. So I want to offer them my thanks. All right, so first, we're going to uh, up here with the Manhattan String Quartet, and that amplifies it better, Ryan Chase who you will see around here teaching courses in our music department. Uh, he manages to be as accomplished as a pianist as he is as a composer, so you might catch him playing his uh, music around here. You are also likely to find him quite far afield from Colgate, uh, where you might find him at prestigious musical festivals like Tanglewood or Aspen. Uh, you might even encounter him and his work at the Cannes Film Festival. I understand that he is currently working on a commission to from Texas, uh, from Texas State for their centennial to make a symphony length, or a concert length symphony on the theme of the novel Dune. And I understand it's going to be wild. So uh, he's agreed, and we're lucky to have him agree to collaborate with us today and with the Manhattan String Quartet to talk us through and think through these pieces with us. Now, Especially for those of you who have been sitting uh, very close to the Manhattan String Quartet in some of these workshops, you might not appreciate just what a experience and what an opportunity this is for you. So since 1988, which is now over 30 years, which is a really remarkable feat, the Manhattan String Quartet, as an institution, not each of these members, uh, has been a quartet in residence here at Colgate, much to our benefit. The Manhattan String Quartet has toured on four continents, They've sold out performances in Tokyo, toured the Soviet Union twice, when it was the Soviet Union. Uh, they have a long catalog of recordings, including an acclaimed recording of the cycle of string quartets by Shostakovich. They play early 20th century music, like what you'll hear today, but they also commission new music. They've played commissioned new music for us uh, at our concert. There's a concert tomorrow evening uh, that you are also welcome to come and hear them play again if you like what you hear today. Uh, and the new music they say is often the, it's often say that they are part of the same kind of thing that you're going to be encountering today, right? They are now making music that is for us today the same kind of creative, disruptive, innovative, artistic endeavor that they'll be helping us to look at from the early 20th century. This, the, this musical tradition, this idea of breaking new ground in music hasn't ended, right? We're still living in it. And the folks here are going to perform a piece from the past, but they're part of, uh, of new disruptive traditions right now today. So like I say, if you like what you hear tonight, there's another concert tomorrow night at 7.30 that you're all, uh, it's a free public concert. All are welcome to come. But for now, I want you all just to take your phones and turn them off or silence them at the very least so that they don't go off during this concert. And having done that now, please welcome Ryan Chase and the Manhattan String Quartet. New podium. Good evening, welcome. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of classical music. The main focus of our uh, look tonight is at Webern's Five Pieces for String Quartet, which was written in the early 20th century. 
Um, it's a bit of an unusual piece. It's gonna probably be the weirdest thing that you've heard in a while, and I know that's saying a lot being a producer myself and working a lot in EDM <laughs> and hip hop. Um, there's actually connections to that world, I think, that are deeper than what's on the surface. Um, but we'll get into that in a little bit. For now, we're gonna try to put this music into context and kind of do a brief overview of the history of classical music. Western classical music is really unique among all the other classical musics of the world, and that's the only one that was written down into notation. We have classical music from West Ghana, we have classical music from Japan, we have classical music from China, but these musics were never notated. They were always passed down in an oral tradition. Our story begins after the decline of the Roman Empire, and what survives of music from antiquity is so fragmented that we have very little to go on. Writings on music by the ancient Greeks and Romans are very vague, with a focus mostly on just the emotive power of music and how certain scales could evoke certain feelings or emotions. And aside from thorough descriptions of how certain ancient instruments work, we know very little about the actual aesthetics of the music. And it wasn't until after the sixth century that a large enough repertoire of music has survived for us to study. As to be expected in Europe at this time, this repertoire was compiled and sustained due to the efforts of the Catholic Church. Musical thinking, even in the songwriting of secular music at the time, was profoundly influenced by Christian doctrine. This music was mostly monophonic, which meant that it consisted of a single unaccompanied melody. It's kind of hard to imagine to us since we listen to harmony all the time, but the idea of two notes sounding against each other would have sounded really unpleasant or dissonant to listeners in the Middle Ages. The umbrella term for the music of this time is called plain song or chant. Okay. Plain song in all of its dialects was always organized by what was called a mode. How many of you have ever had any music training, any music lessons in the past? All right. A mode is basically just a scale. Okay. A mode or a scale gives us a palette of pitches to work with and a sort of constellation of tones that are heard as subordinate to one main note. If I sing a scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, do is our home note. Sometimes we call it the tonic, but I'm just going to call it the home note. It's the note that we always want to get back to. We can have different flavors of pitches. If I sing, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, re, do, si, la, so, fa, mi, re. That's a different sort of sound, a different sort of collection of pitches. I'm going to sing one of these chants for you very poorly. This is based on the Dorian mode, which was one of the scales that they had at the time. This is the Ave Maristella chant. <clears throat> Here we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It goes, Ave Maristella, Dei Mater Alma, Atque Sempir Virgo, Felix Celi Porta. Most of the music is stepwise. It moves from one note to the next. Sometimes there are a few leaps. The big leaps tend to be the same all the time. Bum, bum. If I count up one, two, three, four, five, that tends to be the distance that we leap in these chants between the first tone in the scale and the fifth tone in the scale. Rhythmically, if you were looking at the music I was looking at, there's no indication for how long each of these notes was supposed to last. So I made it up, and that's what they did. There was nothing that actually governed the rhythm or the beat that was happening kind of interesting and it's kind of weird to us who, you know, listen to most popular music or vernacular music or even most regular, regular classical music. It's interesting to note that the development of this separation of music, the development of rhythmic notation, coincided with the development of mechanical clocks. And some musicologists believe that the conceit of dividing time musically was only permitted into music after it was actually applied to the day itself. As music became more rhythmicized from about 900 to 1600, composers began to explore polyphony, or music that had more than one melodic line. Early on, this was just a doubling of the melody, but starting on different notes. 
but in a polyphonic texture, every part is considered a distinct melodic line and equally important to the musical texture. Most of the music that we listen to today is homophonic, meaning that there is a main melody and then accompanimental music that is meant to go along with it. But most of our ears are accustomed to that sort of music, latching on to a primary idea, a primary melody, a primary um, voice of some kind, and then accompanimental music around it. The result of polyphonic music is a really complex web of sound that can sound a little bit alien to our modern ears. And in just a short time, well, relatively, we're still talking about hundreds of years here, music became astoundingly complex. We're going to hear the quartet play an excerpt from Guillaume de Machaut's Messe de Notre Dame, written around 1350, we don't know exactly when, and it's the oldest surviving complete mass by a single composer. This music, just like the chant I just sang for you, is organized in the same mode, that Dorian mode. So we'll still hear those important pitches stick out, the one and the five. Now that we have rhythm in place, we'll hear a beat, we'll hear rhythms, and we'll hear a pulse. Let's listen to the Machot Max. different from the approximations of medieval music we get in stuff like Game of Thrones. This stuff is way stranger than you might have originally believed. We have familiar melodic motion, right? We hear a little bit of a tune, but vertically things are aligning in surprising ways. Uh, and the motion from one chord to the next almost seems too twisted and can be jarring to our modern ears. It was even jarring to some of those ears back then and musicians began to argue with one another about the right way to put these chords together. As you know, the Renaissance was a period of time in which thinkers from all disciplines were looking back to antiquity for truth. Unfortunately, with very little written music from surviving from ancient civilizations, they really had nothing to go on. In music, this contributed eventually to the idea that music could carry rhetorical meaning and that there could exist such a thing as a musical dialectic or an actual language that you could understand just as well as English, French, German, what have you. The idea resulted in the rigorous codification of scales, keys, and how chords were allowed to lead from one to the other. The training of composers during this time began to focus on the specific functions of chords and how they related back to that tonic, that one, that first primary note of the scale. Additionally, composers were taught specific stock musical phrases and ideas, a tradition that lasts to this day. If you know, the, uh, there's a pretty famous YouTube video of this dude playing a, about 100 pop songs, all with the same chord progression. And that's sort of the same idea that we're looking at in the music of the actual classical era, which lasted from Haydn to Beethoven. It's a very short period of time in music history. It's only 75 years long. We say it starts around 1750 and lasts until about 1825. We're going to hear a quartet by Haydn. This is the Opus 77, number two quartet in F major. And this is an example of the language that we all tend to collectively recognize as classical music. Let's hear that. <laughs>
That's probably a little bit more familiar to our ears. At this point, the music is organized in a texture that's relatable to the genres you might be more familiar with. We have a primary melody on the first violin and the other instruments offer an accompaniment. As we can hear, that accompaniment is constantly engaged, almost conversational with the melody. At times, there are antiphonal or call and response moments. At others, the accompaniment pulses rhythmically to help drive the music forward. As far as the horizontal organization of the music, it's much easier to hear where phrases begin and end. Our ears are guided to hear something like a comma halfway through, right? About halfway through, we got to a little break. It didn't sound like the music was quite done with what it was saying, but that there was a bit of a pause. And then an equal length of music followed to complete its sentence, almost like a dependent clause followed by an independent clause, if we're thinking grammatically. We can make these linguistic or grammatical comparisons to this era of music. And the musical ideas established in this 16-bar excerpt that we just heard will then be developed in that quartet and then recast in different ways. We we'll might modulate to a different key. We might explore secondary ideas that we pick up along the way before returning home to the primary material. This can be compared to maybe how an essayist will make a thesis statement at the beginning of an article and then back up this statement with logical proofs based on facts that reinforce her argument. Okay, there we go. Let's get that part. The next century would see composers challenging this problem. Most musicians don't like rules. I don't like rules. And I intend to break the rules, and every composer in the history of music has sought to break the rules. We're going to look at a piece of music in the 19th century now by Richard Wagner, who subscribed to the idea that music had the power to transcend this conventional rhetorical mode of thinking and actually transform our perception of reality and time. In the prelude to his 1859 opera Tristan und Isolde, the music goes by at a glacial pace and is built on a number of strange chords that would sound unfamiliar to listeners in the classical era. We will hear a twisting, yearning desire for resolution to a place of harmonic stability, but it won't ever happen. Let's listen to a little bit of the prelude to Tristan und Isolde. have to wait about four hours to actually feel something settled. That's how long he takes before reaching a proper conclusion. To me, this music is sort of gloopy. It sounds like syrup in the way it pours from one harmony to next and in how slow it is. What's interesting about it is how emotionally overwrought it is, but also how harmonically vague it is. I couldn't point to any one note that they just played and say, that's our home note. That's our main note. And there's a certain degree of decadence to that. 
The music is overly lush and sensual, and by the end of the 19th century, this decadence in music reached a tipping point. At the turn of the 20th century, the rise of nationalism was also influencing musical thought. Composers across Europe made it their business to come up with a distinctly German sound, a distinctly Italian sound, a distinctly French sound, and so on and so on. And as this nationalism began to spread, the codified rules of harmony started to fall apart, as it became more important to composers to find a distinctive sound for their homelands rather than to follow the old-fashioned rules. And this is where Anton Webern enters the picture. A little bit about him. He was born in 1883 and was generally regarded as a quiet person. Of Jewish descent, he resided in Austria and was rather reserved, living a very private life. Webern and a group of his contemporaries known as the Second Viennese School, the first Viennese school being Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, sought to break with tradition entirely, forging ahead with a new kind of music that wasn't bound by any kind of scale, bound by any kind of key. They viewed the music of their peers as sonically reinforcing the domination of the state, the clergy, and creating a dangerous feedback loop into the tide of nationalism that was sweeping Europe at the time. Webern's five pieces for string quartet were written in 1909, just a few years before the First World War. Let's listen to the first few bars of the first movement. Yeah. The first page. Yeah. Far cry from Wagner, far cry from Mozart, far cry from medieval music too. The texture is frantic, the music turns on a dime. There's an emphasis on dynamic extremes between whisper, whisper quiet music and incredibly loud music. We also notice the incorporation of an unconventional methods of playing these string instruments. Melody and harmony become secondary to timbre and color. Let's talk about some of these new sounds, which we call extended techniques. Curtis, could you play a nice normal D major scale? B major? Uh, G, uh, G major. G major. G major. Yeah. Beautiful. Can we hear a Sul Ponticello? G major scale. By bowing closer to the bridge, we achieve an almost glassy sound. Has anyone ever played around with like Pro Tools or Logic or Studio Tools or anything like that? It'd be like taking out the low end of music. So on your car stereo, you have a bass and a treble knob. The effect of playing closer to the bridge essentially is like turning down the bass and turning up the treble. Could we hear Sol Tosto, a G major scale, just a little bit of it? By playing closer to the up, or higher up on the fingerboard, uh, this music becomes a little bit rounder. The tone becomes a little bit more warm in sound. Could you apply the mute and play con sordino or with the mute? By dampening the string, we can get an even darker sound here as well, even yet rounder, and dampening the upper overtones or these tiny notes that we really don't hear you know, explicitly, but contribute to the color of the sound that we're hearing or the timbre of the sound that we hear. Could you play something called legno battuto? Great. So with the wood of the bow, you get a very percussive sound, but it's also very light, very, very quiet. Could you play a few natural harmonics on the G string? Based on the laws of acoustics, just touching a string in certain places will result in notes based on the major chord that that string is on. So could you play an open G string? Could you play the touch octave harmonic? Touch fifth? Uh, 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 touch third? Uh, yep. Yeah. 
Great, yeah, so we start to hear like a major chord start to emerge if we hear um, the natural harmonics. Does anyone have a guitar at home? All the dots on your guitar indicate where the harmonics on your strings are. Great, Could you play some artificial harmonics for us? So in addition to the natural notes on the string, you can fake it by holding down with the finger on the string and then touching a fourth above that. So we get these artificial harmonics in addition to all of the natural harmonics that are available to us on the string. How about a little tremolo? Right, so by bowing really fast, you get that shaky, um, I don't know, it sounds rumbly, uh, sort of tremolo sort of sound. Great. In spite of all of these new sounds, there are still fundamental aspects of music that remain unchanged. We're still moving left to right, we're still thinking in a linear fashion, and certain tendencies regarding the treatment of texture are still retained. At, a cer at certain points, we'll hear things that sound like a melody and certain things that sound like an accompaniment. In the opening to the second movement of Webern's quartet, we see the homophony of the classical era is utilized. There is a melody, and an accompaniment. However, these things have been grotesquely transformed. We hear a little bit of the opening to the second movement of the Webern Court. Today, this style has fallen out of fashion as being a primary style. And in fact, it was even regarded as dated by composers as early as the 1960s, when a new genre of music, minimalism, was born from com American composers who were starting to use recording studios to make music. The first loop music was actually classical music. To give you an idea of where music went after this, let's just listen to a portion of Philip Glass's third string quartet, subtitled Mishima. film about the boxer Mishima slice. Has anyone ever seen uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi? So it's all over that, that movie too, so it's used in that one. We can hear that that piece essentially rejects everything that was associated with Webern's style. The music emphatically follows the rules of traditional harmony, and there are clear rhythms with an audible beat. This music is very repetitive, and the sound has carried over into popular music and film scores as well. One only needs to look at Hans Zimmer's soundtracks to see direct comparisons to the early American minimalists. Robert Fink, in his book, Repeating Ourselves, posits that minimalism reflects the compartmentalization and mass industrialization of the 20th century. He writes that the music reflects the banality of repetition that is reflected in our daily lives, as our nine to five schedule repeats itself daily, as our weeks have a similar ebb and flow to them, like Andy Warhol's visual art, it reflects classical music's response to popular culture and daily vernacular life. Back to Weber. Despite the unique bizarreness of his style, it's still used by composers to convey specific ideas and emotions, particularly on the darker side of the spectrum. The expressionism of the second Viennese school survives today in soundtracks to film, television, and video games to aurally depict the surreal, 
the grotesque, and the macabre. Bernard Herrmann scores to Alfred Hitchcock's thrillers owe a great deal to Webern in the second Viennese school, particularly the film Psycho. The music in this film score is not derived from the harmony of older classical music, but from the language that can be found in the music of Webern and his contemporaries, Alban Berg and Arnold Schoenberg. Let's hear the prelude to Psycho and the beginning of the third movement of Webern's pieces back to back. So first Psycho, you've probably heard this before. To another portion of the Psycho film score. This cue is called The City, and it's over the establishing shot in the film. So just after the opening credits, this is what you hear. Sometimes it helps to have a sort of storytelling or some sort of visual syntax to apply to this music because it is a bit foreign to most of us. It is a little bit strange. Webern's works in particular hang in a limbo between the chaotic noise of life and the grim stillness of silence. And the ease with which one melts into the other is the major insight that I think that we can take from him. Contemporary intellectuals of Webern were concerned with the limits of language with the need for a kind of communicative silence. You can see how Dadaism and surrealism eventually grew out of this problem. Wittgenstein once wrote, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent, marking the boundary between our attempts to understand the physical world and the world of the soul. The impulse to go beyond nothingness, to go beyond silence and into emotional territory that might be completely uncharted is central to Webern's aesthetic. Between the intensity of incredibly dissonant and gnarly music, the still silences will seem all the more fragile. In listening to this piece, Webern's five pieces for string quartet, we're not expected to understand the mathematical processes that unify the piece, and there are a lot of them, but to rather experience them more intuitively just letting the sound wash over us. With a harmonic vocabulary so complex, it's essentially equivalent to nonsense at times. We are invited to lose ourselves in the sheer visceral beauty of the sound and to be in awe of the immense virtuosity it takes to present such a difficult piece of music. So please join me in thanking the Manhattan String Quartet for being here tonight as they present Bayburn's five pieces. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So, just one thing before we play. Thank you for your applause. It's hard for me to tell you not to applaud. But if you could just wait until we're done with this eight-minute piece to applaud. There's something really important about the silences of this piece. 
And so we're going to play sort of all five of these movements as one big arc. So if you could just hold that until we're done, we'd really appreciate it.
thank you all for coming. Um, before we leave, I just want to ask them a quick question, if that's all right. Just a quick, quick question. Um, you know, they've played this piece a lot. Um, I think they bring a lot of tenderness to it. I kind of just want to know, what about the piece has changed for you over the years? Has anything sort of changed in the way you play it, in the way you approach it? And also, by extension, what are the challenges that might be different between this piece and maybe a more traditional sounding piece of classical music? I think for me, uh, finding more and more expressivity in the piece, more and more feeling, more emotion, more intimacy in a lot of it is a, has been a, a nice journey, a uh, nice challenge. Um, Bayburn, of course, writes, uh, you saw, uh, those of you who came to our classes have seen the score to one of the pieces and sees how, so you see how complex it is and how many instructions he gives, but even within those parameters, there, we have quite a bit of freedom uh, of interpretation, and, and just finding those differences every time we play it is, is interesting and challenging for me. I, I, I'd say that, that uh, you know, every time we play it, you can feel if the audience is with you or not. Because the piece is so soft. That, you know, any little thingy that happens in the audience, it, it, you feel it and it affects you. But you guys were fantastic. You both of the classes in tonight. It was a really, really great, great atmosphere. Anybody else? Uh, you said it Thank you. Thank you very much for coming.